I tried to solve this by considering the change in latent energy and did not get the answer. I did not understand how they solved this problem. Could you please explain why they add up the reheating process in this? Yeah, this, so this is a long solution, but it's it's not actually that hard of a concept. We can cover it pretty quickly. So refrigeration system has an energy efficiency EER of seven and a half BTU per watt hour. The system provides 1500 CFM of supply air through a cooling coil. An electric reheat coil is to be added to the supply air discharge. And the modified system will be used to process air from 75 dry bulb, 60 degrees, 60% uh, RH to 75 dry bulb, 50% RH. Each coil has an efficiency of very nearly 100%. The minimum electric power needed is what? So interesting, they're going from 75 degrees, 60% RH to the same temperature, 75 degrees, 50% RH. So how do you reduce the relative humidity without changing the temperature? Well, one way to do it would be with a desiccant, right? A drying agent to just pull moisture out of the air without changing the temperature at all. This is the way I keep water out of my closet, hang a little bag, I live in a very humid area. So you can hang a little, little bag of uh, desiccant salts in there and it absorbs water and it keeps things from getting moldy. The psychrometric process that a desiccant provides is just vertically straight down because the dry bulb temperature is on the horizontal axis, right? Of the psychrometric chart. So if we go from one to two, we're just going straight down. But that's not what's going on in this problem because they're not using a desiccant, they're using a refrigeration process, which means they're gonna cool and dry from one to two somewhere over here. And then they're going to reheat. And the reheat process is purely sensible heating. And ultimately they'll still go from the same starting point to the same end point, but they'll do it via the circuitous route. And um, pretty pretty uh, energy intensive process if you have to cool in order to dry and then reheat, especially because that reheat is being done with an auxiliary heating coil, an electric coil. So there's no coefficient of performance. It's one to one. For every watt you put in, you get one watt of heat out, which is 3.41 BTU per hour. Uh, nothing more, nothing less if it's 100% efficient. You do have the COP for the cooling part of the process, but you're removing that heat only to add it back. You're only doing this whole song and dance just to get the desired amount of drying, which is just a 10% reduction in the relative humidity. That's really what we're after here. So, all right, let me make sure I'm answering the question. Uh, tried to solve this by getting a change in latent energy, did not get the answer. Explain why they add up the reheating in this process. Yeah, so the question is, the minimum electric power needed, what power is needed? The power to go from one to two and the power to go from two to three. The power to go from two to three, let's do that first because that's actually the easier of the two numbers. That's literally just the amount of heat that's being added. So that's gonna be a 1.08 CFM delta T situation. And we know the delta T because we know the temperature at two and the temperature at three. Does it give you the temperature at two? off the coil? No, it doesn't. So we'll have to intuit that some other way. We know the COP. We don't know the temperature at state two. All right, let's hold that thought. T3 minus T2, where T2 is a little bit of a question mark. And then the amount of work done to get from one to two is the refrigeration part which is going to be, um, well, the Q out, or the Q, I guess we should say Q in because it's a refrigeration process. 
how about we just say Q evaporator is going to be M dot delta H, which is H1 minus H2. H1 is fully defined. The state one is fully defined. H2 may be a bit unknown. And then we know the COP. How is that useful? The COP for the cooling part of the cycle allows us to relate the what we get out, which is Q evaporator, over what we put in, which is the work of the compressor. And it's the work of the compressor that is actually, you could also call this W dot one to two, couldn't we? So this is what we're after. So if we knew how much cooling we were doing, and we know the COP and the EER are directly related because they just have different units. So when you when you do a COP, the assumption is that the units are the same. So it could be you know BT per hour over BT per hour. When you do EER, it's the exact same idea as COP, but not with um, same units. The units are for EER are BT per hour per watt. So they're very specific, but it's the same idea. So you could plug in EER here and then just make sure you, you get the units handled. So the only thing I'm missing is what are the conditions at state two? We know the CFM. Does the fact that we know the CFM do anything for us? Let's see what they did. First cool and dehumidify the air to the same humidity ratio as the final state point and then reheat the air sensibly to the final dry bulb temperature. H1, H3, how'd they find H2? If the coil efficiency is very nearly 100%, the cooling process will be from 7560 to the point on the saturation curve of the humidity ratio of 0 0.0093. Ah. Okay, so they're assuming that this state two is all the way over here, all the way on the saturation curve. Move my two over there. Okay, so that's how they're saying this point is fully defined. So that gives us T2, that gives us H2, that allows us to find the amount of cooling that's being done. And then we use the EER in lieu of the COP, and we're able to specify the work of the compressor. And then via the electric coil, it's just going to be the amounts of, amount of sensible heat being added from two to three. So to answer the question, what's the total amount of energy for this whole process? The minimum electric power needed is the electric power to run that compressor. How do we want to call power like this? Total power to run that compressor, W12, plus the power needed for that electric coil to do the reheat part of the process, W23 both of which are findable. So that's the roadmap there. Did that make sense? Or is there anything that you would want to go deeper into there? No, it makes sense. I'll just try it on my own through the roadmap. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the main thing there is just kind of knowing that there's these two separate processes that need to be quantified, but with the understanding that... Um, the, the refrigeration process has a COP, which is like, the way I always look at it is if you have a heat pump or, an, or a refrigerator, either way, you're moving heat. So for every watt you put in, you get to move multiple watts from one space to another. But when you do electric heating, you don't have that, you know, that uh, extra bang for your buck that you're moving energy. You're actually just supplying the energy one for one. So it's pretty inefficient. Um, and I think yeah, if we look at the final answer, the 6131 was the compressor to do the cooling process and the reheat was 9400. Like that's 10 kW. That's a lot of juice. So yeah, yeah work, work it through work it through on your own. And then the, the EER instead of the COP with being different units, um, you know, it's a minor thing, but if you haven't looked at EER in a while, you might kind of freeze up and go, uh oh, 
what am I going to do with this? So just go slow and you'll be okay. So then uh, an- another question uh, for the point point two, uh, why they just went to like saturation curve? They said because it's a, a 100% efficient coil. And I guess the the idea there is that you have to, you in a real we 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 get in the habit, and I I'm I'm definitely guilty of this too, of drawing lines on the psychrometric chart, uh, air conditioning lines down into the left. Let me get another color, like I did initially here. Um, but that's not really possible, and that's not really how air conditioning works. Like in actuality, you can't remove moisture from air until it gets to the dew point. Uh, I mean, until, until it gets all the way to the saturation curve. So in real life, an actual, what the air is actually experiencing is it's just being cooled sensibly. Like this is the air conditioner in your house, right? You turn it on, it, it cycles the refrigerator, it makes the evaporator coil really cold. We move air over that coil and the air gets cooled. That's all that happens is it just gets cooled, cooled and cooled and cooled and cooled until it reaches the saturation curve and then it gets cooled even more. And w- once it gets cooled even more, it's past the point where it can hold on to the water vapor that it has. And, and only then does it begin to dehumidify. And then it goes some distance along that line and I'll just arbitrarily stop at some point. And then we come along as HVAC engineers and we just draw a line that connects the dots. <laughs> and say that the process happens on an angle as though you could stop at some intermediate point along the line, which you can't, you have to go all the way. But when you turn the air conditioner on in your room, you don't move every molecule of air over that coil. You just take a little bit of it at a time. And the rest of the air in the room is unchanged and then it all mixes together. So the the net result of that, depending on how long you run the unit for, is that you you operate along that line and uh you know maybe if half of the air has been conditioned and, and half has not the actual condition in your room might end up kind of like this somewhere along along that line because otherwise it would be cold and 100% humidity which is which is the discharge air conditions from the coil so that's kind of why there they wanted us to kind of think about a traditional air conditioning cycle, which goes all the way to the saturation curve and, and down the curve and, and ends at a specific point. And um, I guess I just become so accustomed to, because you could imagine, um, you know, any number of lines here. When you when you kind of designed and worked on a bunch of these, you, you you get accustomed to being able to control it. So you could pick any number of lines that go to different points on the saturation curve. And, uh, you know, you can stop at intermediate positions, but that's being done with mixing. That's not actually what's happening at the coil. And that's what this problem wanted us to examine. Okay. Thank you. Sure.